podcast again. So for this week, we have a, one of the really exciting speakers. I think you're just like find him amazing. So Dr. Rodriguez is maybe one of the reasons I find him really interesting is he actually has an electrical engineering undergrad background, <laughs> like and then through became a war. Uh, <clears throat> Did a bunch of really interesting work in RF identification technology. In fact, he even received a US patent. And then he switched career to move into the medical, became a physician in there. I thought the interest of maybe this is his analytical technology background, switch into the medical side. I think it gave him a really, really interesting uh, perspective. And then let me maybe uh, turn the floor to uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah. So. Thank you, Milton, for a uh, generous. Uh intro there. I'm very pleased to be here with you and uh, as Milton said I was going to talk about uh, top 10 tips for making telehealth work. Um, I am a family physician and I'm a clinical physician meaning that I see patients really uh, almost the entire time um, and I'm here in Northern Virginia. I figured what we do is uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, 10-15 minutes, kind of give you an overview of what I'm doing here and then uh, of course we'll uh, go on from there with Milton uh, has for us question lines. So um, for those of you who are uh, geographically disinclined or uh, maybe remotely interested, um, I'm actually here in Northern Virginia. That's the very tippy top up here, this red state. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, where I am in Ashburn, Virginia is right at that very point at the very top. And this is really important because first of all, this is not the view from my backyard. Uh, but rather uh, just to illustrate the fact that we're very close to D.C. We're about 30 minutes to the west of D.C. and about 30 minutes to the east of the uh, Shenandoah. So we have sort of a, a diverse landscape here, and it really plays into the reason why, or one of the reasons why, uh, we decided to do telemedicine. This is actually more what uh, the town it looks like, or at least looked like, back in 2003 when we first arrived here. Uh, this is the uh, general store at the site of the, uh, the tree, the ash tree that burned. That's the name Ashburn, Virginia. And um, this is really the way things kind of looked when I got here. It's got 90, had, we've had 90% growth uh, since we've been here. And really just down the street, we, uh, we've had this go on. Big names, the, the names you might remember like AOL and MCI, WorldCom, UUNet. And really this became a technology corridor and what uh, folks in, in this town like to call the bullseye uh, of the internet. Uh, in 2016, the uh, stat that uh, we, I guess, like to talk about here is that 70% of the internet traffic here goes through uh, our little town of Ashburn, Virginia. This is really uh, the, the folks that I spend most of my day with. Uh, these are my two nurses, and uh, Haru and Catherine, they uh, basically run a lot of my day. They, have, they help me to establish a very efficient workflow. And uh, Peru and Catherine uh, will uh, see the patients from the very beginning, find out exactly why they're here, get a little bit more information, verify all their past medical history. They get their medicines, they review it, and they really set me up for a home run every time. Or at least if I don't hit a home run, it's my own fault. Uh, so uh, the point here is that we have a very efficient workflow and uh, we've worked this out over time and uh, when we were thinking about telemedicine it was very important to make sure that we had this same kind of efficiency. My initial goals uh, here for this program, telemedicine program, were really to access patients who don't have uh, access to me. Maybe they live out west of here or they just can't get in. Um, or maybe because of all the new traffic uh, that's, that's happened where they used to be able to come to, to see me, they can't see me any longer. Um, or some of these folks, tech-savvy folks that uh, work in Washington, D.C. downtown or work in some of these uh, you know, computer data centers that uh, just don't have time uh, but certainly have access to technology. And so the goal, initially at least, uh, was to uh, accomplish these two things. And so this worked out pretty well. I started by synchronously connecting with these folks. Uh, I would ask them to see me at a prescribed time, maybe we'd say at uh, Thursday at 2 o'clock. Uh, I, I'm going to meet with you and we'll get together and, and, and conduct a visit. And things worked really well. Patients really loved this. They uh, clamored about it, but it was not a very efficient network. And, and you can see that if I'm the one that's connecting with them myself, I'm not taking advantage of that synchronous, or of that uh, efficient workflow that we had established, that my nurses and I had established. So we decided that 
really more needed to be done. Also, coming back to this, whoa, coming back to this page here, uh, uh, we were also planning to bring this to other offices in our in our uh, work environment. So you can see it throughout Northern Virginia here, but other offices as well that we wanted to bring this uh, technology to that weren't all on the same uh, electronic health record system. Uh, so it was very important that we had a platform that would be able to play with all these different locations. We truly had growing pains there. Now it's appropriately up on the screen. Um, and so really what I had to do is revise the needs. And I think this is a very important point that I learned along the way is that really when you're coming into a new technology like this, you do need to revise your, be prepared to revise your needs and, and change gears very rapidly. Certainly this is important in any program that you put together, but it's particularly important with telemedicine as the landscape is changing, not only for you, but nationwide and worldwide. I decided that patients, we need a system that the patients didn't need to log into. This was too clunky and it was a barrier to access. I patients needed to be queued uh, in uh, to a waiting room. I needed to be able to have established that workflow very similar to what I had uh, been using very efficiently in the office. Also, I needed to be able to have a platform uh, that would work with all the different platforms uh, that uh, we had in the different offices. Lastly, of course, you saw the map. It needed to be scalable. And so really, uh, connecting up with patients individually was not leveraging uh, my, my established workflows that were working beautifully in the office. I also realized that I would not be able to duplicate, nor should I try to duplicate what was uh, in my existing office and put that online. That's when I came across these guys and uh, what I really liked was the fact that they were uh, adaptable. Um, every time I'd ask a question, uh, can I do this or that, and they'd say, yeah, we can do that, we can do this, we can do that, and um, that's really what I needed to hear because I had looked at many different systems and some of the large, very uh, popular systems that were popular then and are even more popular now and um, they just were not uh, going to suit me uh, for what I needed. So uh, what I did is I picked VC. This was like uh, something that, that finally matched what I needed to, to, uh, to make a, a system work. This is what I've got currently right now. You can see I've got a, uh, well actually this is a couple of versions back but very close to it. You can see that patients can access my system here um, from the main website and when they click on it, it takes them to an agreement with the patient and this agreement satisfies some very uh, important points. Um, this, you know, legally it allows me to make sure I'm, I'm tackling the, the legal aspects and then also it sets the groundwork for the visit so that um, patients understand you know, ahead of time that, hey, we might only uh, tackle one item during this visit. Um, or you may not get a prescription in this visit, just like you may not get a, a prescription whenever you do a visit uh, in the office. Certainly no narcotic medications. Uh, you have to be in the state of Virginia in order to use my system. Um, all of these things that are not only legal, but they also help to set the ground rules and allow patients to have a very pleasing visit. They know what to expect. Once they tackle, or once they tick off all those check boxes, they end up here in my waiting room. And uh, they put their name in on the top, they put the reason in there for the visit, and they're ready to go. This is what it looks like on my screen. So when I am seeing a patient, um, very familiar scenario, instead of looking over the top of my uh, computer uh, or my laptop, I'm actually just looking at them at the boxes. You can see what I've done is I've put the patient there at the very center so that it aligns with my camera and so that I'm looking at the patient very much like I hope I'm looking at you right now. Um, and it looks natural. I put my face over to the side and uh, that way I know kind of you know, what my patients are seeing, what they're experiencing from me as well. So this should be a very familiar uh, setup for most doctors and indeed it is for our staff. This is my very first patient. And uh, she's given me permission obviously uh, to, uh, to use her in the presentation. She's very proud that she was my first patient in this, this setup. And she said a quote that I really think is wonderful and is just as apropos today as, as ever. It's nice to know my doctor's right here in my living room. And you know, when I discuss this with other physicians or other groups and, and try to get them on board, I usually show them this slide and I say, I want to get you here. And we can usually do it pretty quickly. This is, this is where you want to be. Patients love this. 
This is my other waiting room. I've got a waiting room that's physically outside, uh, you know, the uh, clinical area. Um, and this is one that's being monitored by my staff. So again, taking advantage of workflows, um, I'm able to, to do this. Um, this is what my patients might see. Now again, patients have different devices, so it is possible that they're going to have different views. But in general, um, the same kinds of things apply. They're going to see themselves, they're going to see me, and then there'll also be a shared portion of the screen. If we do share things, uh, it will take up a portion of the screen, as you can see. I'm reviewing a patient's medications here. Very, very important key point that I learned is got to engage the patient. Make the patient a part of the visit. Get them active in their care. This is a maxim that really makes a lot of sense anywhere. You always want your patients to be involved in their own care. It's particularly important and, in, and particularly advantageous for this medium to engage them. Fantastic uh, way to, uh, to go. You can show them diagrams. You can uh, really take advantage and lever leverage the fact that they're involved in this technology in a bi-directional conversation. So the platforms work very well. Once again, I transition back to my main screen. I get this question all the time, won't, won't dwell a lot on it, but you know, what kinds of diagnoses can you see? There's a whole host of diagnoses. We can certainly talk about that later if that's something that's of interest. Um, but actually, I do find it very, uh, a, lot of, a lot of doctors uh, and staff find it very surprising that you can deal with some very interesting diagnoses that you wouldn't expect using this platform. Um, and of course, you must do, as always, with safety. So, uh, but it's very interesting what you can do. Okay, so basically this is my, my workflow. Patients need care, and there's two things. You have on demand and by appointment. And using the screen and hyperlinks, basically I'm able to, to shuttle these folks to where they need to be and get the type of care that they need appropriately. Patients do need a lifeline. Um, we'll probably maybe want to talk about this a little bit more, but clinically, uh, when you're implementing your program, it's very important that your patients have access and know how to use the system. It's amazing. Everyone loves it. You do need to teach them how to drive it. It does not take much. And boy, once they get it, they really like it. So what we'll do sometimes is maybe send them a text so that they're not having to navigate the web so that they can count on just clicking a button to get care. And that's pretty darn cool. So it's analogous to throwing them a little lifesaver. Okay, so once again, I'm reevaluating the goals of the telemedicine program, and I kind of wanted to stress this because, again, this is very important when you're making your system. You not only need to restructure your goals um, and, and reevaluate, but you need to be prepared um, to have a, a system that's, that's able to adjust with you. My new goals here engage patients. I realize that that's the crux of what I need to do. I need to be the Amazon of medicine for these folks. When they've got a problem, I'm there. And whether it's late at night and they need information, or whether it's during the day, or whether they're off in a different part of the state, I want to be there for them. That's really ultimately my goal. And you can see this is somewhat different than, it was, than what I had before. And then, of course, retaining patients and attracting new patients is almost a, a subset of number one. So really, again, engaging the patients is phenomenally important. Uh, Another thing that's very important too, and before I get into sort of our little top 10, and there's probably more than top 10, top 20 uh, kinds of things, um, really engaging your staff, I really want to make sure that, that you understand, as in any new program, you have to engage your staff, and, and certainly there are times when I've done that well and times where I have not done that well, um, and I've learned the hard way. Um, if you don't engage your staff and you don't make it easy for them to succeed, they are, they are not going to be able to, to bring this technology to your patients. So it's very important because the biggest tool you have to let patients know how wonderful a product you have is to have your own folks excited about it. Uh, and I, I know telemedicine is not unique in that way, uh, but certainly um, it is especially important in, in a new technology. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of go through, you know, sort of a, a last hurrah here of some uh, lessons learned, and then you know, if there's anyone that's interested in. Uh, some of these things uh, in more detail, we can certainly go through them. Um, number one, got to know your goals up front. Okay, so in my case here, my goals changed, and I, and I purposefully let you know what my goals were sort of throughout the process. They changed. Uh, so flexibility is very, very important in, in this process to me, and I would imagine it will be for just about anybody. 
Uh, if your goal is to decrease utilization, uh, then you, you, you're going to have little different challenges than for folks, let's say, who uh, really want to be able to offer the service and make it pay for itself. Because there are challenges, certainly uh, not insurmountable challenges whatsoever. I think uh, some folks have not leveraged their own technology and their own workflows, um, and therefore this has been one huge barrier for a lot of folks to bring telemedicine uh, programs forward because they cannot make these things uh, cost effective. Uh, so really know what your goals are up front. And, and, and it sounds trite, but it's very, very important. Number two, know what your customers want. I guess the, the famous quote uh, of Steve Jobs is, how do, how do my folks know what they want? I haven't told them yet. Uh, and that may be true to some degree. You, you may have to guide folks to let them know what they want. But patients pretty, are pretty savvy, and you really have to study them because you can waste a lot of time and a lot of money putting something together that is not going to be uh, helpful to them. Number three, identify your workflow. Probably one of the most important things on the list. Uh, we've talked about workflow. Keeping hammering down on the workflow, very, very important. Again, a lot of people will spend a lot of money, waste a lot of money, because they're not really clear as to what their workflow is. If you identify your most precious resource and work from there, that can be very helpful. In my case, the most precious resource was really physician time. It's certainly one of the most expensive times. So if you think you're going to set up a data bank of physicians and they're going to just start rolling in, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter what your size is. You have to have this rolled out so that you um, identify workflows that keep these folks um, appropriately busy as they want to be. Number four, choose a platform. And you'll notice this is not number one. This is number four. It's not because it's not important, it's because you really need to think through what you got, uh, you know, which, what your needs are before you choose a platform. Again, in my case, very important to have flexibility, and I think at this time in the, in, in the stage of telemedicine, telehealth, flexibility is going to continue to be very, very important. Got to give legal advice. This goes without saying, but again, this is uncharted uh, territory, very important. We certainly did that early on, and uh, it's... Uh, helped us to feel very good about the service that we offer and know that we're doing the right things. Six is keep it simple. Very often I've seen folks over the last several years, large groups, large institutions, sink tons of money, millions of dollars into programs, and they don't necessarily pan out. And why? Try to get too tricky. And I think it can happen to all of us, and of course it happens to all of us in different programs at different times. Important to keep things simple. And... Um, I would point back to numbers one, two, and three. Number seven, let gravity be your guide. If you're having to click around and have patients weave around and jump over hurdles in order to see you, it's time to rework that workflow. So very important. Number eight, engage your staff. I don't think we've said this uh, enough. If we said it 10, 12 times, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, again, if, you'd, if they're not aware of what you have and they're not excited about what you have, and they call and ask about it, and your staff doesn't know, and that's not so good. But if they're enthused, they are really going to get out there and let folks know about it. Got to throw patients a lifeline, really make it easy for them. Um, one of the big surprises that I had was, why wouldn't patients absolutely jump for joy? This is an absolutely wonderful thing, and everybody looks at it, who's and ahs at it, I'm bringing in this brand new jet, so, uh, and it looks slick and everything, but if no one knows how to fly it, it's not going anywhere. So you really have to make it easy for them. Number 10 is get patients active in their care. This is where you really can shine in telemedicine. You are going to engage your patient. You've got a relationship with them. You can accomplish so much when you do this because um, utilization goes down, there's trust. And when there's trust, as with any, any operation or anything in life, be it politics or one country to another, trust really... Uh, breaks down a lot of barriers and makes things a lot easier and expends a lot less energy. I'm going to throw in one more, and that is when you're at a critical juncture, uh, remember it's about engaging your patient because if you're relevant to your patient, if you are someone who frequently or consistently meets their needs, then you're important to them, and that's what you want to do, and you want to uphold their trust um, by being, uh, being there for them. It's about engagement. So that's basically sort of a quick overview of what we've got, Milton, and, and um, certainly I'd be glad to hear from anyone at any point if they have any other questions.
Okay, I think at this point right now I'm having some difficulty hearing. Uh, let's see. Um, I can you hear me? Uh, I got you right now. Now I got you. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Great. My <laughs> Michael, I also want to thank you so much for the wonderful thoughts and the tips in there. Um, one question is that uh, you've been doing telemedicine for many years. You see a spectrum of different visits. My answer, um, so what, what kind of visit do you find is most uh, conducive for telemedicine? You know, that's a great question, and, and um, I only briefly touched on it before. Um, I really find that some of the things that one might think telemedicine is best suited for are probably the lowest yields. For instance, really the toughest thing for me to do is look, you know, treat an ear infection. It's so simple. You look at an ear and that's it. It can be difficult if not everyone has an otoscope in their home. And if you're, if you're going into patients' homes, they're not going to have an electronic otoscope uh, available for you. Um, what I do find, and, and there are ways of, of you know, asking patient about, patients about symptoms and treating those kinds of things, but what I really find is very helpful is even something like abdominal pain. And of course, when you, when you talk to a room of physicians, they might look at you kind of funny and say, what are you talking about? But you, know, you can ask folks where their abdominal issues are. Um, you can ask them how long they've had it. Um, you can ask them all kinds of questions and very quickly narrow down and, and prevent a two, four, six thousand uh, dollar emergency room visit just by asking some very uh, key pointed questions, putting a fence around them for safety. So if they if they have fever, if they have any of these warning signs, that they do seek in-person care immediately. Um, but what you can do then is have frequent contact with them. And boy, it makes a big difference. Patients are happy, physicians and providers are happy and uh, certainly costs go way down. So I really find some of the most interesting and, and, and best uses of telemedicine are not the things that you might find to be the, the ones you expect, the easy things. Got it. Interesting. interesting. I guess so. If you have, like, let's say, you know, like, so physician typically are fairly busy already. You have a lot of these sort of like, you know, visits. But does that do you find that this is that sort of increasing your workload, or is it you know your workload is like? Uh, how do you plan for that? It's almost like, let's say I'm a physician, I have so much workload, if I offer telemedicine now, do I expect to you know, have to work more hours, or how do you handle that? That's a great question, and, and, and so um, really uh, I find that it works best, and again, we talked a lot about workflows. Um, I found that in order to really make this be something that is um, paying for itself, I had to integrate this into my day. There really is no extra time to work in. So I use this as a tool very much like I'm, uh, you know, a carpenter might use a hammer and just say, um, you know, it's another tool. And it, it's kind of interesting because uh, a lot of times my next patient, um, you know, I will go into a room and we, we, we set aside a room for a visit, even for video visits, so that it's quiet. When I enter that room, only at the very last second might I know that the patient's actually in the room. They might be across the street five hour car ride away or they might be behind the door physically, I don't know. And to me, honestly, a lot of times it doesn't really matter. So to answer the question, I think if you can integrate it, at least for my workflow, my needs, into your daily routine and don't just set aside hours, I think that you end up with a greater efficiency. So no, it doesn't increase my workload, it makes my workload less. Okay, that's really one for the share there. Because I think for most physicians, it's almost, almost a little bit like they introduce an EMR that actually increases their workload rather than decrease. Good to know that you actually figure out practice now is actually making it efficient. Yeah, I don't find it at all. I, I actually find it helps. Now, if, now, of course, now you have more patients probably that want to see you, um, in which case uh, you have the good problem of, of getting more folks that uh, know how to use the technology and can help. That makes sense. I guess. Um, uh, Michael, may I ask you, like, uh, so how do you build for telemedicine, and have you had any issues in terms of like, getting reimbursement from the private payers? Or like that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, you, I'm in, lucky to be in a, a payer parity state, and I guess the majority of the state, uh, states are now, certainly 30-plus uh, uh, in that range are payer parity states, meaning that we're supposed to get reimbursed uh, for uh, the visit, whether it's telephonic, meaning that it's a video visit, uh, as we would get uh, for an in-person visit. That doesn't mean you do get it. <laughs> you do get reimbursed. 
So you do have to uh, hammer out some of the obstacles. Um, you may need to talk about this with payers and, and understand your contracts. Um, and um, I think that a lot of this is going to go um, to the wayside as Medicare realizes that they're going to need to come up with provisions for these visits. Um, certainly, uh, once that happens, then I think all the payers are going to uh, start to knock down the barriers. Right now, of course, Melvin, as you know, I, I, I can't see Medicare patients like this unless there's very tight stipulations. But I will tell you that once that happens, that's going to knock down a lot of barriers. Uh, but still, uh, we have so many patients that use the system now that uh, you know, it works quite well. Got we do it. get reimbursed, bottom line. We get reimbursed. <laughs> nice. And, uh, I guess, um, uh, Michael, do you, was, is there was any like a uh, malpractice insurance issue? Because I know that's one of the frequently uh, physician asked me, like, does the current malpractice does it cover that? Do you need to get new insurance? Well, how do you handle that? You do want to get good legal advice. You do need somebody to review what you've got going on. You do need folks that are aware of you know, the services you intend to provide, uh, make sure that they're covered. Uh, most of the insurance companies now do have provisions already in place. This is nothing new for them. Um, however, you do want to just make sure that, that you have that in place so that uh, there are no concerns. But yeah, with, that's not been an issue. Got it. Okay, excellent. Again, in terms of what I mentioned about sort of like uh, having sort of like the legal advice, and they're like, so what was maybe some of the issues like, uh, you know, your counsel really has to help you work out? Uh, yeah, um, you know, what we did is we basically identified folks that happen to be quite good and, and well known in the, in the area of telemedicine to help us work out these workflows. and. Um, you know, or not workflows, but you know, work out the, the uh, legal issues. Um, sh we show them exactly what we have, and, and it hasn't been a problem at all. Got it, got it. Okay, excellent. Okay. So we have a, um, a question from the audience, uh, Ada. Uh, so she said, like, um, I think this is going back a little bit earlier. And so her question is, uh, so how do you specifically, for example, to like listen to the heart, get the vital, look at the ear infection, like telemedicine? Again, it's in more case if the patient doesn't have any of those you could maybe just ask them to come into your office, or how do you? Fantastic. Yeah, so it, it really depends on the kind of system that you have. Now, um, it's, it's not feasible at this juncture to have a uh, stethoscope in everyone's home. So if your diagnosis and your treatment is going to hinge completely on exactly what you hear, uh, then that, that can be a problem. I would say that the vast majority of visits that we have can be enhanced in the office by listening to them. But you really make the majority of your decisions, 90%, as we always say in medicine, 90% of your uh, uh, treatment, you know, really lie, or your, your uh, diagnosis comes in the, the patient history. So we end up using our ears a whole lot more in a different way for listening to the patient. If it turns wow. out that it really is key to listen and auscultate, um, then we may not be able to do it in the patient's home. Certainly, this technology is very much available, um, and so if you have a patient that does have access to, the, to this technology, or you have patients that you know may need to have their heart auscultated, uh, then this is something that's very easily done. But you can also accomplish a tremendous amount, um, even without listening to the heart. You can solve a lot of problems, or at least put a fence around the patient's concerns or problems so that they have a margin of safety and they know exactly when they need to come in to be listened to. Got it. Thanks for the tip. Um, we have another audience question from uh, JP. Uh, so he was asking about, um, so uh, f from your experience, do virtual uh, visits generally supplement uh, in-person ones, or more the, per the patient tend to both receive virtually and for the same spell in the illness to receive in person as well? So, in other words, it, it, I guess the question is, uh, does it supplement or does it, is it stand as a standalone kind of visit? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think primarily most of mine are uh, standalone visits. I think we pretty much, I'd say about 85, probably higher than that, 90% of the time can, can satisfy what we need uh, just with our online visits. There are times, occasionally, we convert those visits and this is the nice thing also about having folks right there on site is we just simply say, you know what, I can't tell. I'd love to have you come down. Let's take a look. And we do it, and patients love it. You know? uh, but at the same time, uh, most of the time, we can actually uh, take care of things right there 
Uh, the, the, the Excellent. Uh, so we have another audience question from Yash. So the question is, um, so how does uh, sort of telemedicine, like what were you were you doing, compare to like, these sort of asynchronous platforms, things like how do you sort of remote care, uh, you know, remote patient care management or some of these? How does it compare by doing it asynchronously versus this? Uh, the other yeah. Do you like do, you do anything asynchronous to monitor patient, or do you purely is just like get on the video call and? Um, right now, I'm primarily because I'm a, a an outpatient uh, provider, uh, and I'm doing these visits uh, the way that I'm doing them. I have a very efficient workflow which involves my nurses. It involves handoffs. Um, so I end up doing the majority of my day in asynchronous kinds of visits like that. And when I say asynchronous, remember, I, it's not that they're giving me information or giving me uh, pictures or anything else like that. It's that, um, I guess we call that store and forward in telehealth. I'm, I don't do store and forward. Um, and of course, you would have a hard time getting, getting reimbursed for store and forward. Uh, but uh, I don't really do it that way. When I say asynchronous, what I mean by that is that a patient has a need and uh, I meet that need, but we don't agree to meet up at, at a specified time. Um, they come in when they need to, and then I take care of them. I spend most of my day that way. Now, you could do synchronous care, but that's not going to be primarily what I'm doing in this case uh, during my outpatient visits. Okay, got it, thanks. So I have another question from uh, Will. Uh, so he's asking, um, so if you were to sell telemedicine to your fellow physicians, uh, what would you say like the top three benefits are? Uh, well, boy, that's a <laughs> down. Uh, I would say, you know, again, my patients do get engaged. They are just very happy. Um, it, it, and they look then to me to give them care. Um, and I think it, it helps me to stay in touch with my patients. Um, it helps me to be top of their list. Uh, or hopefully, I don't want to get carried away here because I don't know if that's true. But the idea is that it it does allow you to be uh, in the in the forefront of their mind more uh, whenever you can can reach them. So that's a big one. Um, it's very satisfying for my staff. You know, one day I was I was talking about uh, telemed or I, I was listening to my staff, my two nurses talk about telehealth with someone else, and they said, you know, I just love these visits, and they had no idea I was listening. And they said, I love these visits. It's so much easier, and the patients are always happy. So you know, I'm sure there's going to, you know, there's a time when they may not be happy, but they are happy. And when they're happy and my patients are happy, it's kind of hard for me not to be happy. So, uh, so I, I'd say from that standpoint, uh, that, is, that is good. And then I'd also say that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's fairly, it's, it's something that's very easy. I can do just about anywhere. I don't necessarily have to have set aside you know tons of rooms for this. So I think it's very efficient. It makes folks happy, and it keeps me engaged with my patients. Those might be three of the top. Got it. That, that's really nice. Uh, we have another audience question from Sam. So he said, uh, so Sam is from Australia. So he says um, he has probably you know, for one of the issues about patient attending appointments uh, in there. I guess a typical piece for office, maybe a no-show type of thing. Do you find that telemedicine is something that actually can sort of like a, you know, improve this sort of appointment no-show uh, raise? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I could see it going both ways. Um, I would say right now my patients tend to show pretty well. Um, and I think part of it is because it's, it's something that's special. You know, it's something that, that they, you know, I don't know. I, you know, that, that might that might help the no-show rate. That really might help the no-show rate. I don't know. We haven't done any uh, statistics on that. Certainly the access issue is just phenomenal. And, and usually what I hear after every visit, I finish the visit, and gosh, sometimes I'm getting on a side tracker, but sometimes I'll finish a visit and I think, gee, I really did not do much for this patient, and I'm feeling pretty bad. And there'll be a silence, and they'll say, I gotta tell you, I just love this. And you think, wow. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's like my one patient said, I like having my doctor here in my living room. Maybe that was the reassurance that they needed. Um, okay. So uh, I don't know. We'll have to. That's a great question. We'll have to look at, at that. And thank you from Australia. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, we got another audience question from Christopher. Uh, this is actually a really interesting question. He says, uh, so a lot of things, uh, uh, there's a lot of these sort of administrative things we do as doctors. For example, you give out things like return to work, you know, the, like school notes for the, the kids, or things like the disability form, handicap placards. Like, do you do any of the, uh, these over time medicine? Oh, that's fantastic, yes. Um, you can do a lot of these things a lot more easily because uh, you, if you have, or obviously you should have a secure platform, uh, then you can exchange information that way and it's fantastic. So um, yes, you can do that. We probably don't do as much of that, um, I would say, um, but you know, as far as uh, notes and things like that, but you certainly can. And it's actually wonderful, right? Because most of our notes now, who really handwrites much anymore? Mm -hmm. Everything is pretty much done online. So, um, or you know, through your electronic health records. So yes, it's fantastic. That's wonderful. Nice. We have uh, another question for um, Miguel. So he says, uh, so Virginia is a parity law in there. So he suppose he was asking, uh, is there, um, you know, in practically, is there any like just practical issue with reimbursement? Or is there any like, uh, is there any tips, you know, on the things may not go as smoothly as you know, the parity law? <laughs> Yeah, it may be larger than they appear. Uh, yeah, I, I really, again, I think it's very important that, that folks be upfront with their payers and, and let them know that that's what they plan to do, make the you know, ground uh, rules very well known ahead of time. Um, again, just because it is a fair trading state doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get reimbursed, but you do want to grease the skids, you do want to know, and it's great if everybody is above board. Um, honestly, we really have not had what we expected. Um, now that may change as access increases. We may see pushback, so that may be the case. Regardless, uh, remote medicine is happening. It's going to happen. So it's you know, it, you know it might as well be on the ground floor of that. Got it. So do you do uh, a cash payment for these services? Like do you like have patients do it into credit card information? Do anything always purely re like a reimbursed phase? Um, you know we don't. Uh, we treat this. Uh, we don't to answer that question. Um, obviously, there are modules that are available, um, and, and, um, and I know that you guys even have a, a module that's available. Um, we're still in the keep it simple, uh, but I will tell you that that is making it very difficult. It's so simple now to add these modules, as you well know, and then, uh, it would be, it's difficult not to do that. But uh, we don't. We don't, and I think that would be one of the next steps. Okay. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> I guess um, one of the questions is uh, <clears throat> uh, from Titus. Uh, so, so his question is: uh, So, do you have to employ uh, like a remote interpreter as well in the days where? How does that handle? Do you have a patient who requires a different uh, language support and how? To, yeah. Yes, um, you know, at this particular point, that has not been an issue for us. But if it is, of course, we have to take special precaution, just like we would. Uh, for patients that came in that needed to have uh, special services, uh, whatever they need, we definitely need to, to be attentive to them and, and we do it in a timely fashion. Um, has not been a huge um, you know, concern. We do have doctors that, that do speak different languages and this obviously is a very nice benefit. Um, and I do see patients, um, let's say for instance in Spanish, and uh, I think patients enjoy that. Uh, just like they do an in-person visit, and I think it's satisfying for me as well. Um, this is correct, and I think that there are, and my understanding is, and in discussing this with our legal folks, um, there are laws that are coming, um, and there are laws that are there, um, and we treat it very much like we would if a patient came in uh, to our regular office. You do need to act, and you need to act quickly to make sure that they get the same care that everyone else gets in the coach. Got it. Okay. Um, so here's another audience question from Heather. Um, so uh, she's asking, so for example, um, there's a lot of these renewal technology, things like specifically a biometric uh, identification technology, like things from like the palm or retina or fingerprint, all these things. Do you see that as something that can uh, you know, have the impact, for example, making it easier to identify the patients and secure PHI and those things? Like, what's your thought on uh, Oh, that's those? great. It, that's just that's great, and it seems like every day there's something new. Um, obviously, 5G, which everybody's excited about, in a few years uh, we are hopeful is going to just make this thing you know just bust wide open, and, and that's going to be just tremendously exciting. It will give us the chance to make better decisions. 
Um, there are some things that are just very easy right now, you know, uh, that are available, pulse oximeters, um, scales, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thermometers. Some of these things, you know, patients can take their own temperature, for instance, and, or they can take their own blood pressure, that's fine. But, you know, it's also helpful for folks that can't, that it's automated. Uh, we do, this is obviously going to make uh, telehealth just bust wide open. And, okay. uh, so as the technology comes along, we're also going to have fewer false readings. This gets back to what you said before about when you're monitoring patients, you don't want to have uh, erroneous readings and spatial. As the technology gets greater, certainly 5G holds a lot of promise for decreasing the error rate and increasing the efficacy of these platforms. Sure. Got it. So, Michael, my answer is so, so right now, like, how do you identify the patient? Do you, or do you just know the issue if other patients are by face already? Or do you have issues like someone like, you know, pretend to be some patient, do a 10 medicine college, get you some prescribed well, something? Great question. You know, uh, there is something to recognizing your own patient. There is, there is validity to recognizing visually your own patient. Okay. Uh, legally, you know, that, that also adds some weight as well. Um, we do ask our patients as well to show identification, um, and uh, that that does help. And it's a very easy thing. I mean, you can simply just show your your card, um, and that that's a very easy way to identify. Just as well as you would if they came in person. Certainly, people can impersonate in person, uh, but but yes, we have to absolutely know that we're seeing the right person. And who else? First of all, we need to know that where are the patients. We need to ask them that. Um, and you know, we also need to verify who's who's there with them, you know, who's in the room with them. So it's just like any other visit. That makes makes sense. Uh, we have another audience question from Sandra. So she's asking, for example, uh, so we talk about a lot of these were status go, blood pressure coming up, and she's asking specifically some of these were like that, like um, wellness, like things like Fitbit uh, trackers and those kind of things. And you know, do you ever use those thing, data into your uh, as you're seeing the patient? Boy, that's really great. Um, I, the answer, the, the quick and dirty on that one is no, I don't. Uh, I will use it just the way I would use it in the room. Uh, I am not harnessing the technology there. Uh, I'm going to play the card of keeping it simple for now, simply because there's so many things to tackle. That is clearly going to be the way of the future. We clearly are going to need to have that information um, in portable. And I think if we have that data and it's not in portable, then that's going to be another situation where we're using uh, duct tape or scotch tape, and we need to come up with a new workflow because clearly, if we don't start finding a way to harness that and incorporate that into our uh, our uh, EHRs, then we're, that's that's going to be an inefficiency. So, to answer the question, no, I don't. I really don't, but I do see the value in doing it. Okay, thanks. Um, so here's another question. And this is a question for Basil. He said, "So there's like there's so many telemedicine platform out there. It feels like there's literally hundreds and thousands out there. Like, so how like what would you be your advice for him to finding the right platform?" Well, um, that's a good question. I think nothing beats trying to be as informed as you possibly can. Um, know your requirements. Mm -hmm. um, know what you need. I think flexibility. There's a lot that speaks to it. Um, it's also surprising that some of the larger services are powered by, uh, you know, some of the platforms that do offer uh, this adaptability. So you can sometimes look under the hood and say, hey, if this service is not working for me, who's powering them? And uh, that can be very helpful as well so that you can find out, you know, maybe you can adapt the service to your own needs. Uh, but certainly you gotta got to be informed. Um, regional telehealth uh, Networks are available throughout the country online. These are services that are available to folks for free. Uh, you can find out more information from your regional telehealth uh, center, and um, these are just a, a treasure trove of information. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, another question I have is so, so one of the things we find is like when a physician initially is offered telemedicine, it's something just hard for the for the patient to get to know about the service and just get the adoption rate going up. So, so in your case, do you like, how do you let your patient know that you actually have the server? Do you email them? Do you, do, how do you market it? Do you advertise it? How do you let people know you got this great service? Well, you know, this is a tough thing because um, you don't want to, you, people love this and you know they're going to love it. And so the minute you advertise it, kaboom. And if you don't deliver, then you've let them down. So how do you, you know, that's been such a tough thing over time. Um, so we've been extremely cautious, and some would say too cautious. 
Um, and we, we want to be careful that we don't have death by pilot because if you keep piloting and piloting and aiming and aiming, don't fire, you got a problem. Um, I think, uh, again, probably the best way of advertising is through our own staff. Um, you know, finding creative ways to make sure that our patients are aware of the service. You know, in medicine we say that patients have approximately two visits a year. You know, everybody's got their own number, but in general, they're not coming in once a month, typically. Um, and so, when they come into your office and you, and you tell them about the service while they're there, it may be too late because it might be another six months on average before they come in to, or need to use the service again and by that point they may have forgotten about it. So you do need to find a way to reach these patients before they need you. Um, and that is, therein lies the challenge. So what I would say is you do have to balance it with how ready are you versus uh, you know, to, to launch a service and, you know, but then once you open that floodgate, then they're going to want it. They're going to want the service. Um, you know, you can, you can do a lot of different ways, you know, uh, to uh, advertise, but um, you have to get a little bit creative and know your own uh, population. Okay, super. I guess um, we have, uh, again, this, this uh, apology that a bunch of these were uh, questions that this were pouring in there. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the webinar, so we will not have time to uh, Answer other questions, but all the questions will make available to Michael. So we can again, we're going to review, uh, answer them. We're going to put them online afterwards. And so I can apologize to the audience when we didn't get to your <laughs> questions. Uh, I guess the final thing, uh, question, maybe uh, Mike, I would like to ask you to as we wrap up. So today, right on the Capitol Hill, for you know 30 minutes from you, they have this massive debate on the Obamacare, Trump care, all these Ryan care, all these things. Like if you had the uh, uh, if you could have whispered into the years of President Trump, like what were you, some of the things you would tell him that can impact, you know, for have from the impact like telemedicine, even the healthcare uh, overall. Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, you know what I would say is I would say in a nutshell, let gravity be your guide, because mm -hmm. you know using an old engineering maxim, you know, uh, gravity always applies mm -hmm. at least here on the planet. And, um, you know, this is really the way that patients are going to need to be treated. It, it is not feasible for them to uh, get in a car, uh, take half a day off, go wait in a waiting room, uh, come in to see you, and then lose a, a majority of their day. The efficiencies and workflow alone are just not there. So if we were looking at it from a global standpoint, from a population standpoint, there's a lot of inefficiency in having people take a majority of their day off to come in. Now, sometimes it's definitely necessary, and you got to do that. On the other hand, uh, we can certainly make things a lot easier and get rid of a lot of inefficiency and waste uh, just by that alone. So I, I would say, you know, telemedicine, remote medicine, whatever we want to call this, uh, it is coming. It's here. It's already here, and we, we do need to acknowledge it. We can't turn our back on, on the science. But I think we also need to embrace it because I think there's a lot of beauty. You know, I uh, I think you know Mike Lefevre, the the uh, head of the U United States Preventive Services Task Force, uh, made a statement one time in a, in a talk that I heard. I thought it was very uh, applied very much. He says, "Always remember that change represents loss to somebody. So there is change here, and some people are going to fight this. And I get it. But I would say that in general, those who actually uh, take the time to em embrace uh, telehealth really will find that uh, it's very rewarding and uh, you know, I think as long as you work on those workflows, adaptable, be flexible, and I think move forward, it really is something that is of the future. Got it. Really, thank you so much. Definitely, hopefully, one day you can whisper into his ear and have your thoughts and improve, impact the country. Yeah. Huge thanks, Michael. Again, to the audience, again, thank you so much for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, so, for next week, uh, we actually have a really interesting. Um, a speaker who's going to focus on one of the famous uh, lawyer in the telemedicine state. So we're going to dive into all the nitty-gritty legal issues. I definitely invite you to come back next Thursday and able to talk to one of the leader, a thought leader in the legal space on the space. Again, thank you so much, Michael, for this wonderful tips. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it all. Thanks.